Okay, let's change gears and move on from cirrhosis and start talking about hepatitis. So hepatitis, regardless of the cause, is simply inflammation of the liver. There's a variety of triggers that can cause hepatitis, and I've had I have it broken down, so we'll go over each of the major causes shortly. Hepatitis can be acute or chronic. It could also be indolent, where it's not causing any damage, but it could also be fatal, so it's good to know the differences. There's several subtypes of hepatitis, like I just alluded to. You can get alcoholic hepatitis. You can get non-alcoholic hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis. You can get drug-induced hepatitis, ischemic hepatitis, and viral hepatitis. So let's go over each of these six subtypes of hepatitis in a little bit more detail. And we'll start with alcoholic hepatitis. So as the name suggests, alcoholic liver disease in general is where consumption of alcohol damages your hepatocytes. This damage has, is most commonly affecting our zone three or centrilobular zone of the liver. This should make sense for a couple different reasons. In the anatomy section, when we talked about our liver lobules and zones, I showed you this somewhat complicated slide. What I want you to realize here is that the zone three, the centrilobular zone, has the highest concentration of P450 enzymes and the highest mitochondrial content. And so if we start with the P450 enzymes, the problem with alcohol is that it is a, it can damage those P450 enzymes directly. And it, once it interacts with those P450 enzymes, it'll create reactive oxidative species that can damage that specific zone initially. And keep in mind, the damage isn't just confined to zone three of the liver. I just wanna point out that if they tell you where, where would the damage be most severe and they, they listed all three zones of the liver, they probably want you to pick zone three or the centrilobular zone. Additionally, this zone three has the highest mitochondrial content. And as we know, alcohol is a mitochondrial toxin as well. So if alcohol comes into this region, it can damage that mitochondria and fat accumulation generally begins in this zone first. So I've talked, I've put this slide up to discuss the alcohol liver diseases more broadly. So you can get alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, you can also have something called alcoholic hepatitis. And finally, if the damage is severe enough and irreversible, you'll end up having alcoholic cirrhosis. So I'll just talk about the differences between each of these really quick. So alcoholic fatty liver disease, as we just saw in the liver lobule, I mentioned that the mitochondria can get damaged and fat deposition usually begins in zone three of the liver. So how does that fat deposition even occur in the setting of alcohol use? So alcoholic fatty liver disease can also be referred to as hepatic steatosis. And the pathogenesis here is that metabolizing all that alcohol is going to increase your NADH to NAD plus ratio. So you're going to get a higher ratio of NADH than anything. And what's going to happen is when you have all this NADH, it's going to change your reaction mechanism to where you're gonna get increased fatty acid synthesis and decreased fatty acid breakdown or oxidation. So let's draw this in a diagram to make so, so it makes more sense. So if we have uh, alcohol or ethanol, what's gonna happen is ethanol is degraded to a compound called acetaldehyde and that's further degraded into acetate and that's how we metabolize alcohol in our system. And there's two enzymes we need to know in this pathway. The first enzyme that degrades ethanol to acetaldehyde is called alcohol dehydrogenase. And the second enzyme that degrades acetaldehyde to acetate is acetaldehyde, excuse me, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. While we're looking at this basic reaction mechanism, I, I'll just go over a few things they like to test. This isn't necessarily GI related, it's more uh, toxins and other pharmacology, but while we're here, it's good to keep this in mind. Uh, some people will ingest methanol or ethylene glycol. Usually it's in two settings. One is an attempted uh, suicide, and then the other is 
somebody who has alcohol use disorder and they don't have any alcohol in hand, so they might try this um, instead because some of these have a sweet flavor. And then a third, actually, now that I think about it, a third cause of methylene glycol or ethylene, methanol or ethylene glycol intake is if a child accidentally gets into somebody's like shed and, and ingest this. So if either methanol or ethylene glycol are ingested, um, what's going to happen is that this methanol and, or ethylene glycol will use that same alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme to form a toxic metabolite. So it's actually safer for the body to keep it in the methanol form or the ethylene glycol form rather than allow it to form this toxic metabolite. So you actually treat this in one of two ways. You can usually what they'll do, which you, you can give them ethanol technically. This is kind of a little bit frowned upon, but you can give ethanol because what that'll do is that that'll force the alcohol dehydrogenase to uh, use all of its resources to convert ethanol to acetaldehyde. And in that process, methanol and ethylene glycol would be unable to use that same enzyme to form the toxic metabolite. What's more common, and you're probably going to see this on tests if they give you a question like this, is they'll want you to pick fomepazole, which is an alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitor. And in this way, you're going to keep it in the non-toxic form. And just as a heads up here, something that I, was, I always thought when I was studying for this, I thought, what would happen though, after your fomepazole's old, uh, after your fomepazole has basically completed its course, are you still going to have the same problem where you have methanol and ethylene glycol sitting in your system and then it's just going to cause a delayed reaction? Well, what actually happens is that if you inhibit enough of these enzymes, there's still some ethylene glycol and methanol getting converted to their toxic metabolites but it's nowhere near the same levels that cause a really, really bad reaction. So you're, you're almost slowly tapering it out of your system using this medication. While we're looking at this diagram, I just wanted to talk about one more thing, which is disulfiram. So disulfiram can be used in alcohol use disorder. It's not really used as often nowadays because the person who has the disorder can just not take the disulfiram and then they, they can still, it doesn't reduce the cravings in any way. And what do I mean by this? So disulfiram will inhibit the other enzyme in this pathway, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And if you inhibit this, you can get a buildup of acetaldehyde in your blood. And acetaldehyde in your blood, if you have too much of this, it's gonna feel very, very bad for you. You're gonna get nauseous, you're gonna have vomiting, facial flushing, and Something to note is that some medications, like uh, a few of our antibiotics, like metronidazole and Bactrim, can cause this disulfiram-like reaction. So anybody who's taking these, you usually advise them to limit or ideally avoid their alcohol intake to avoid this disulfiram-like reaction. So I just wanted to point those out, but let's move back on to the bulk of what I was talking about earlier, which is why would a significant alcohol intake result in fatty deposition in your liver. So what is happening here is that alcohol metabolism, as I alluded to, increases your NADH to NAD plus ratio. And it does that through both of these mechanisms here. In order to convert ethanol to acetaldehyde and to convert acetaldehyde to acetate, you need NAD plus to be converted to NADH. So notice through this process, we've already gained two NADH just with this one, this one specific ethanol compound being metabolized. And so over time, all this extra NADH is going to increase your fatty acid synthesis. And that happens because if we look at the mechanism to convert our storage form of fat, all of our fatty acids, in order to convert this, to oxidize this into a usable energy source like acetyl-CoA, and I'm just showing you on the citric acid cycle here, you can see acetyl-CoA is, is highlighted in red now. This is an important uh, compound to kind of get this process started to use it as energy instead of having it stored as fatty acids. So in order to do that, you actually need to convert an NAD plus 
into an NADH. We just noticed though from our previous mechanism of converting ethanol to acetaldehyde to acetate that we're gonna have a huge buildup of NADH. So if we have this big buildup of NADH, it's gonna either decrease the, the pathway going from fatty acids to storage because we just don't have enough free NAD plus anymore. Or it could even, if you have so much NADH, it can reverse this reaction to where now you're having your acetyl-CoA uh, stored as fatty acids. So you're getting increased fatty acid synthesis in this case, and you're getting decreased fatty acid oxidation or fatty acid breakdown. So people who have alcoholic fatty liver disease are typically asymptomatic. This doesn't really cause symptoms. On labs though, you're gonna find they might have mildly elevated liver function tests and it could be your AST and ALT should be raised, but your AST to ALT ratio will be unique in that the AST will usually be greater than two to one ratio to ALT. And our mnemonic for that is our toast to alcohol where you have your AST before the two and then you have your alcohol. So AST to two to one ratio. On histology, you're gonna find a few things. You might see something called Mallory bodies. And you could also see macro, macro vesicular fatty changes in the hepatocytes. So Mallory bodies, are cytoplasmic inclusions due to intermediate fil filament damage in your hepatocytes. And if you look at the center of the screen here, you can see a Mallory body right here. It provides this twisted rope appearance as you can see how it has this twisted rope. And I, I just remember when I hear Mallory, I think of a, a girl's name. So I think of the hair, Mallory's hair here that you can see inside of each of these cells. And you'll see Mallory bodies. It's not exclusive to um, alcoholic hepatitis specifically. All the alcohol liver diseases that we've talked about can, can result in these uh, Mallory bodies. You may also see macrovesicular fatty changes in the hepatocytes. So what are these? So these are basically fat globules that are getting so large in your hepatocytes that it's kind of pushing everything else out of the way. So you have these large fat vesicles and they can distort the nucleus. So I'm gonna circle a few of the cells here. You can see many more. These are macrovesicular. You can see this massive fat globule here and it's pushing the nucleus out of the way to where you can't even see the nucleus in the center of the cell anymore. You see macrovesicular changes. It's not exclusive to alcoholic liver disease. It's actually, you can see it in fatty liver disease, alcoholic liver disease, and some forms of viral hepatitis. And so my mnemonic for remembering macrovesicular changes is that you're gonna see it in adult or macro, you know, when we become macro, like uh, when we grow all the way up, then you might see these conditions. Later on, when I talk about microvesicular changes in things like Rye syndrome, which is a childhood disorder, I use that you, you're, when you have a microvesicular disorder, you're gonna be micro or young, generally speaking. So now let's talk about alcoholic hepatitis, which is the subgroup of hepatitis that I wanted to discuss initially. So what happens in alcoholic hepatitis is that you have excessive alcohol consumption and that leads to an acetaldehyde toxicity. So if we go back to our framework that we discussed earlier, if you have so much alcohol coming in, that's gonna be converted to acetaldehyde and subsequently converted to acetate. But sometimes if you've consumed too much, you're gonna overwhelm some of these enzymes and they're not gonna work as fast as they need to. So you're gonna have um, not necessarily a blockage like that X indicates, but you're gonna just have a buildup of the, the products before this reaction. So you're gonna get a buildup of acetaldehyde. And we saw from people who take disulfiram that if you, in any way, either inhibit that acetaldehyde dehydrogenase or you build up your acetaldehyde in any way, it's gonna cause some pretty significant symptoms sometimes. So in this case, you can get right upper quadrant pain and hepatomegaly. You can get a fever, as we'll see with most of the hepatitis with that itis. 
You can also get jaundice. Similar to the other alcoholic liver disease, you're going to have that classic AST to ALT ratio of greater than 2 to 1. And then on histology, you're going to have those same Mallory bodies and macrovesicular fatty changes that we just saw in alcoholic liver disease. And alcoholic cirrhosis is just basically the final form of each of these diseases. So it's going to be irreversible liver damage because of these chronic insults. This fibrosis and sclerosis is most noticeable in the central lobular zone of the liver, which again shouldn't surprise you given the propensity of that zone to have a lot of P450 enzymes and a lot of mitochondria. You might have regenerative nodules form due to that chronic liver injury, and you'll see regenerative nodules in a lot of forms of cirrhosis. And the histology is pretty much the same that we just saw. You'll see Mallory bodies, you'll see macrovesicular fatty changes, and you can see sclerosis and fibrosis. So we've talked about alcoholic hepatitis and the whole alcoholic liver disease subgroup there. Now we're going to do the same thing, except for this time we're going to talk about non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So I'll start with all of the non-alcoholic liver diseases. So this is liver damage, as the name suggests, that develops without exposure to alcohol or other hepatic toxins. It's often related to metabolic syndrome, such as insulin resistance or obesity. So this can improve if you reverse any of these. So if, if you have weight loss or you know, good dietary control, that can help with this condition. On laboratory findings, you're going to, again, have elevated LFTs. But this time, because you're not having specific damage to the mitochondria, that might increase your AST ratio more than your ALT ratio. This time, you're going to get more of your classic hepatitis picture where your A ALT should raise more than your AST. And so there are three subtypes to non-alcoholic liver disease. There's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, also known as NAFLD. You can get non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. And finally, the, the end form of each of these would be cirrhosis. So let's do the same thing we did and break down each of these subtypes, starting with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is our initial stage of the disease, which can progress to the other two subtypes that I just discussed. And so how this one works is that you're going to have uh, fatty, basically you're going to have free fatty acid infiltrate your liver. And that can happen in a few different ways. But I want to point out that in both of these mechanisms, insulin resistance appears to play a pretty significant role in causing this cascade. So just as a uh, clarification, uh, insulin, as we've discussed before, is more of our storage hormone. It can bring things into cells. So it can bring glucose into cells. It can bring free fatty acids into cells. And so if we have our bloodstream and we have a random cell here, if we have a bunch of glucose and free fatty acids in our bloodstream, the nice thing about insulin is that it can help us out there and, and transport help make the cell more receptive to these free uh, compounds in our bloodstream and bring them into the cells. And this can decrease our blood glucose level. It could also make sure that our free fatty acids aren't getting in, into other places that they don't belong. So if we have insulin resistance though, what's gonna happen is that all those free fatty acids and all that glucose, instead of going into the cell that it's supposed to go to, it'll remain in our bloodstream. And if the adipocytes are intaking less free fatty acids, that means a lot more of those fatty acids can ultimately reach the liver and deposit in the liver. While this is going on, insulin resistance in and of itself can also up upregulate li liver lipogenesis. So it's actually, while you have this process going, you have additional free fatty acids that are just being produced by the liver spontaneously. So you kind of have a double-edged sword here where Free fatty acids have two different mechanisms to deposit because of this insulin resistance. And as you can see, both of these processes lead to fat deposition in your hepatocytes. 
So the symptoms of this, just like the symptoms of alcoholic fatty liver disease were asymptomatic, this is generally asymptomatic. And the treatment is diet and weight loss. And now let's move on to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So this occurs when you have an influx of those free fatty acids. And sometimes those free fatty acids, if you have too many of them, they can cause oxidative damage to your hepatocytes. So again, if we have our free fatty acids that can't enter the cells, they're gonna form in the liver and those free fatty acids can occasionally cause uh, an acute inflammation of your hepatocyte. And this can, again, this can progress to liver cirrhosis if the damage is severe enough or chronic enough. And on histology, you're gonna see something called ballooning degeneration, which I've highlighted here, which can, they kind of look like tissue paper almost, these cells. And then cirrhosis, I don't have an, uh, a slide for cirrhosis specifically. I just wanted to reiterate again that cirrhosis, as with mo many of these diseases, is more of your final stage because of chronic inflammation and chronic damage to these livers. So this case would be chronic damage from those free fatty acid deposition in your liver. Now let's move on to autoimmune hepatitis. So autoimmune hepatitis, is uh, caused by autoantibodies that interact with your hepatocytes, resulting in liver damage. There's two subtypes. This is fairly low yield. I don't think I've seen it tested on the two subtypes, especially for step one. But type one is the most common and it's seen in adults. You can get type two autoimmune hepatitis, which is less common and seen in juveniles. Epidemiology, this is good to know. So the, they'll test this as a woman with some other autoimmune disorder. Every question I've seen on autoimmune hepatitis has, has, has had this classic presentation. And so you can see somebody, they might have hypothyroidism, UC, celiac, Sjogren's or RA. And the symptoms of autoimmune hepatitis, it's usually asymptomatic if you catch it early. Um, if they are symptomatic, you're going to have your classic hepatitis symptoms, which we're going to see in pretty much any form of hepatitis. You can get abdominal pain, jaundice, or fever. And so laboratory findings are important for this. You're going to get significantly elevated LFTs. Uh, if you test them for ANA, their ANA level will be sensitive. And their anti-smooth muscle antibodies will be more specific. So. The especially good to know about the anti-smooth muscle antibody in this case. And this is a slide from our uh, previous lectures. We did. I showed this on the colon and I showed this in the hepatobiliary lecture because I think it's good to know each of the antibodies, the autoimmune antibodies that you'll be tested on. So in autoimmune hepatitis, our mnemonic was that if because the liver is a smooth organ, you're going to have positive anti-smooth muscle antibodies. I just added this last part here. Uh, if you ever see something with anti-LKM1 positivity, that could be positive in that type 2 autoimmune hepatitis, the one that I mentioned that's less common, and you see it more often in juveniles. I honestly think that for step one purposes, it's really good. You need to know that anti-smooth muscle antibody for sure. And you need to just remember there's that classic presentation of a woman in her 30s or 40s with another autoimmune disorder that's got these you know, non-specific hepatitis symptoms. Just keep the anti-smooth muscle antibody. As long as you remember that with that presentation, you should be able to get the answer right. They're not going to try to trick you on this one. Uh, usually you treat it because it's an autoimmune condition. You need to kind of turn off your immune system a little bit. So you can treat it with either steroids or immunosuppressants. And the complications of this, so it can progress to cirrhosis. And as we've talked about before, anything that can progress to cirrhosis can ultimately lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. And another complication 
for as with most autoimmune conditions, unfortunately, is that you always run the risk of relapse. So now let's discuss drug-induced hepatitis. So drug-induced hepatitis, especially for step one, it's going to be related to Tylenol or acetaminophen toxicity. And the risk of having this happen is highest in somebody with pre-existing uh, liver disease or if they're using alcohol use with Tylenol. And so this can present with fulminant liver failure where you have AST and ALT in the thousands. And it's usually related to some sort of overdose, either intentional or unintentional. And so what's happening? How does, how does acetaminophen actually cause this uh, liver damage? So what happens is that acetaminophen, most of it is metabolized to a non-toxic byproduct, but there's a very small portion of acetaminophen that gets metabolized into a compound called NAPQI. And normally when that happens, we have a, a compound called glutathione that will see that NAPQI and it'll immediately neutralize it. So there's no problem. However, in acetaminophen toxicity, what's going to happen is that some percentage of that acetaminophen becomes NAPQI. And we have so much of our glutathione being consumed in this process that we'll actually have a little bit more NAPQI left over and that can damage the liver. So let's draw this out. If we have acetaminophen here, it can go in one of two pathways. It can either get uh, metabolized appropriately. That could be through glucuronidation, sulfation, or and then that could all get excreted. And so most of this goes through this pathway. However, some of this acetaminophen goes through, gets metabolized by CYP2E1, which is occasionally tested. And this um, this CYP this P450 enzyme, if it metabolizes acetaminophen, it forms that that potentially toxic byproduct of NAPQI. And keep in mind, once this toxic metabolite has been formed, it can either be degraded quickly by glutathione into a non-toxic metabolite, or if it has time, that NAPQI can directly damage those hepatocytes. So in acetaminophen, in acetaminophen toxicity, if we have so much acetaminophen, we're going to deplete our glutathione stores, and this will increase the amount of NAPQI that can damage the liver directly. So how do we treat this? There's two things we can do. If, if they had recently ingested the acetaminophen, you could consider giving activated charcoal to limit the absorption from the GI tract into the portal system. But what how they're going to test this more often is that they're going to want you to know that and acetylcysteine is the is the preferred medication, and they really want you to know the mechanism of action, which is that it'll replenish those glutathione stores to neutralize the NAPQI. So remember here that because we've depleted our glutathione stores, the NAPQI has had time to cause all that liver damage. If we have N acetylcysteine, that could be converted into glutathione. So now we have our glutathione stores back and they can start neutralizing this NAPQI into non-toxic metabolites, ultimately uh, reversing that liver damage. Now we'll talk about ischemic hepatitis, also known as shock liver. And so this is liver damage due to shock, basically due to organ hypoperfusion. And so this would be seen in your critically ill patients you're gonna have significantly elevated LFTs as well here. And how do you fix this? Well, you're gonna need to, ideally you can find a way to recover your perfusion. You might have to give fluids, you might have to give them pressors, and then you're gonna have to treat the underlying cause, figure out why they're in shock in the first place. And if you can fix that cause, then hopefully you'll be able to restore some perfusion to the liver. On histology, you're going to see zone three necrosis. And again, if this is our three zones of our liver, just recall that zone three is our least oxygenated zone in general. So remember that 
we have our proper hepatic artery and our portal vein that both drained from our portal triad into our central vein. And from our proper hepatic artery specifically, it's gonna carry a lot of oxygenated blood. But as that oxygenated blood diffuses throughout zone one and zone two of the liver, you're gonna lose some of the oxygen. And so already at baseline, zone three is gonna be relatively more depleted in oxygen than the other zones. And so if you ever have a condition in which you have a lack of oxygen in general, you have hypoperfusion, then that zone specifically will be at the most risk of uh, damage. And we'll, we'll conclude our hepatitis portion of this, um, we'll, we'll conclude the hepatitis portion of this lecture with viral hepatitis, which is probably the most commonly tested hepatitis on here. And so regardless of whether it's hep A, B, C, D, or E, um, these all hold true. So this is all; these are all inflammation of the liver due to some sort of viral infection. It's usually gonna be hep A to E, like I mentioned. You can get EBV, CMV causing it. They're not gonna test you on that though, really. You can have it acute or chronic. And so let's talk about how this can present. This can be asymptomatic, but if it does present, it's gonna give you your classic hepatitis symptoms that we've been talking about. You can get fever, you can have jaundice, nausea or vomiting. You can have dark urine. You could have right upper quadrant pain. And on labs, you can either have a mild transaminitis. You can also have significant transaminitis, an acute infection. So it's pretty. the presentation is pretty variable. It, it's not going to trip you up, though. They're going to give you your classic hepatitis symptoms if they're in acute uh, hepatitis. If it's really bad, if it's like a severe acute hepatitis, you could be going into liver failure. And so you can have a high PTINR, decreased albumin and all that stuff, in addition to all the, the uh, excessive transaminitis and all that. And another laboratory finding, and I'll go into detail as we go through each of the different types of hepatitis, you can get positive serology markers. And that's usually how they end up testing these anyway. So regardless of the hepatitis, you could get a macrovesicular steatosis as well as councilman bodies. We saw the macrovesicular steatosis when we talked about both the alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic. And that was just when you have this big fat vesicle that's kind of pushing everything else out of the way. And I have a, a few of them circled on the screen here. And again, you see these in more older conditions like fatty liver disease, alcoholic liver disease, and you can see it here as well. And my mnemonic for that was that these conditions generally happen at an older age, like when you're more of a macro person. So you're going to think of that because later on when I talk about Rye syndrome, a childhood disorder, that causes microvesicular steatosis. Viral hepatitis can also cause councilman bodies, and these are eosinophilic globules of apoptotic liver fragments. So what, what does that even mean? That just means that your liver cell was infected by hepatitis and it went through apoptosis, which remember that's the controlled cellular suicide where the liver cell knows that it's infected and it, it performs the steps in a correct manner, manner to shut off essentially in an organized manner. And you can see that right here, these, this pink stained cell that's slowly, that's kind of gradually dying here. That's a, a councilman body. And you'll see this in mostly tested in uh, all the viral hepatitis, but you can see it in yellow fever as well. And so some complications we have to keep in mind when we're talking about viral hepatitis is that some of the viral hepatitis, especially hepatitis B and C can cause a chronic infection and if you have a chronic infection, that can lead to liver cirrhosis, which can in turn lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. And of course, death is a complication, not only of this pathway where you get HCC and die from hepatocellular carcinoma, but even in acute hepatitis, if, if you have really bad acute hepatitis, you can go into liver failure and die from that as well. And treatment's gonna depend on which hepatitis we're dealing with. So as I go through each of the uh, five main hepatitis, hep A, B, C, D, and E, we'll talk about how the treatment may vary.
So we're, we're gonna go in alphabetical order and we'll, so we'll start with hep A. And so this is a, an RNA picornavirus. It's transmitted fecal orally. What we'll find is that hep A and E, which are kind of our front and our back of our you know, alphabetical hep A and E, those are both gonna be our fecal oral transmission. So a lot of people remember that because it's the front and the back of our hepatitis, just like this fecal oral, oral is kind of the front and back of our GI tract. So the risk factors for hepatitis A, you often see it on tests in travelers, somebody who traveled to an endemic country. You can also see this in daycare. And another thing they love is this uh, association with shellfish consumption. And so this will present differently depending on whether you're an adult or a child. In adults, you're gonna notice the symptoms. It's gonna be fever, malaise, nausea, vomiting, jaundice, right upper quadrant, abdominal pain. So all those classic hepatitis symptoms that we mentioned, you're gonna see it very, very pronounced. It'll last about one to two months. And children, on the other hand, oftentimes they are asymptomatic. So to diagnose this, uh, you can use uh, serology testing. And so you can use the anti-hepatitis A virus IgM, which will detect an active hepatitis infection. You can also use the anti-hepatitis A IgG, which is a protective uh, antibody. And that'll uh, tell you whether or not the person either had hepatitis A in the past or was vaccinated. Just want to point out here, you're going to see a lot of these anti um, dash that all, all that means is that your body has produced an antibody to whatever comes next on that net. So in this case, all this is telling us is that our body has produced an antibody to the hepatitis A virus. And in this case, you can have an IgM antibody and we can have IgG antibodies. This will be important when we talk about hepatitis B, because you're going to have a lot of different, uh, serology markers. And so that's, it's good to get this framework in mind now before we get to hep B. And so I have a, a pictorial representation to make sure we understand the difference between IgM and IgG antibodies, because again, this will be important regardless of whether we talk about hep A or another different type of hepatitis. So let's say this is the virus that ended up somehow getting into your cell. Early on in an infection, IgM antibodies are going to binds to whatever is causing this damage. And so let's say hepatitis A is in this uh, hepatocyte. So this purple thing will be our hepatocyte. What'll happen is that initially our body has these IgMs. And so why, why does this even happen? Why do you have IgM first and then IgG later? Well, IgM, as you can see, it has five different arms here. And each of these arms has two binding sites. So this thing here, can bind 10 different antigens if it wants to. And so it's kind of useful early on in an infection because it can give you, at least it gives you more opportunities to bind to something. The issue with the IgM antibody is that it's not as specific. Like these antigens, sure you have 10 binding sites, but they're not perfectly in tune for every hepatitis A virus, for example. It'll take time for your body to mount an immune response and to create an antibody that's specific to that uh, viral subtype. So either way, my tangent there was just to say that early on in infection, we have this IgMs, which can bind to you know either the, the virus directly, or usually it's gonna bind to some sort of antigen that's presented on the surface of a cell. And so if you ever see IgM, as I just talked about, you're, you're only gonna see this early on in an infection. So if you ever see an IgM antibody, that, that that's telling you that there's some sort of active infection going on right now. Over time though, IgG is gonna start predominating. So over time, we're gonna have our lymph nodes and other cells can produce antibodies. And these are more specific to whatever antigen was presented initially. And these are gonna be IgG antibodies. So over time, either whether it's a, it might be a late infection, you'll see this transition from IgM antibodies to IgG, or you'll still see these IgG. Let's say that that hepatocyte or that virus has been killed off and you don't have an infection anymore. You'll still see these IgG antibodies. So this anti-HAV IgG right here, you'll still see this in our bloodstream if we measure it. 
And that could be either due to a resolved infection in the past or because of an, a vaccination that kind of produced the same immune response in the past. Um, hepatitis A is a self-limiting disease. So as long as you make sure that they are adequately hydrated and you keep them symptomatically managed, then the disease will should go away on its own within one to two months. Now let's move on to hepatitis B. This is caused by a DNA hepatinavirus. And the classic transmission patterns you're going to see is, are all the Bs. You can get it through birth. You can get it through blood products. Or you can occasionally get it through bodily fluids. So for, through sexual activity. And this will present in adults. This will usually be a resolving infection. It'll be those same acute hepatitis symptoms and then they'll, they'll go away. In neonates though, it's more often to be chronic and it's usually symptom asymptomatic, excuse me. And as you can see here, one of the risk factors for hepatitis B is birth. So you can you can transmit this from mother to child. And that's why we have, um, a sp that's why we, we check for hepatitis B as part of the prenatal screening and we make sure to vaccinate early if we can. So on laboratory findings, you're going to uh, find classic hepatitis B serology markers, and I'll, I list some here, and notice how there's a ton of different markers. You have your antibodies here, and you also have these AGs. I'm going to explain what all of these mean so that you'll never miss a hepatitis B serology question again. So all I did is I moved all of those different serology markers to this slide, and I want to break down what all these markers mean, because it can be very overwhelming sometimes to see all these different letters and dashes. So how we're gonna do this is we're gonna take a virus and we're gonna give it a core, and we're gonna say that this virus has antigens, right? So it has antigens all over it. It could be inside the cell, it could be on the surface, and our body can actually take those antigens and produce antibodies. And so that's the whole point of how we mount an immune response to anything, right? We we detect the antigens and we say, oh, these are not these are not antigens that belong to our own body. So I need to mount an antibody to attack those antigens and kill the cell or virus or whatever it is. And so all of these serology markers that you see up here, all of these guys, they are either antigens that are produced by the virus itself or their antibodies that are produced by our own immune system to counteract these. So the antigens you can see, anything with an AG here, this is an antigen that's part of the hepatitis virus. And anything with the anti, as we talked about with hepatitis A, is going to show you this uh, anti HBS, anti. So all these are just different types of antibodies that we can use to determine whether or not our body has encountered one of these or what where it is in mounting an immune response if, if we did get infected. So we'll start with that. So we understand the difference between antigen and antibody. The next thing we have to realize is that there are three different types of antigens. You can see this red, this, this yellow, and this blue. So there's three different types of antigens we have to know for hepatitis B. There's our surface antigen, which will be denoted with an S. There's our envelope antigen, which you can see here denoted with an E. And then there's a core antigen, which is denoted with this C here. And we have the surface here is this red one, the envelope I'm gonna use as this yellow triangle, and the core one will be stuck inside the core, that'll be our blue one. So all I've done now is all seven of those uh, serology markers that we had labeled up there, I've just categorized them by whether or not it has to do with the surface antigen and the antibody associated with it versus the envelope versus the core. And so now I'm gonna draw that classic diagram that you've probably seen in other study aids before and that's confused you in the past. And let's go over exactly what's happening with each of these antibodies so and antigens so we understand it moving forward. So let's start with the surface antigen and antibody. The surface antigen itself is we're gonna it's gonna be this thing right here. So this gets released from the virus during an active infection. Another thing I want to point out is that 
when you vaccinate somebody against hepatitis B, the vaccines give this surface antigen directly into your bloodstream. That's all you get is just the surface antigen when you're vaccine. You don't get the envelope antigen. You don't get the core antigen. And that's going to be important later on when we have to distinguish whether or not somebody had an infection in the past or they were simply vaccinated in the past. We can actually use this idea to determine which one is which. So our HBSAG, that just means our hepatitis B virus surface antigen. If it's positive, you have a current infection. This is only released during acute infection. So if it's ever positive, you have some sort of acute infection. We don't know if it's acute or chronic yet. We just know that there's some sort of infection going on. It could be an acute infection where you have your surface antigen at time at, at a short time. So you see how the surface antigen is going up as your virus is replicating, your levels are going up. And if it's an acute infection, that means that our body actually does what it's supposed to do. It creates an antibody. And then once it gets up to the top here, as we create antibodies against this antigen, we start killing off the virus and it starts going down and it's going back to zero. So that would be an acute infection where you have an acute rise in your uh, surface antigen and a, a decline as we've created antibodies to, to counteract that. It could also be chronic though, where you have the surface antigen rise, 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 and we don't mount an adequate response and we just have this chronic infection where we have some sort of surface antigen being released all the time. Let's talk now, I'm gonna put it back to where, as if we had an acute uh, HBV infection where you have this, this is our uh, surface antigen. How, why this would even go down is because we'd start producing antibodies to that antigen. And that would look something like this, where you have this antibodies finally being detected in our bloodstream. And if you had an acute infection that went away, you'll have some sort of antibodies staying around to make sure that you don't get reinfected. And if you ever have a positive uh, surface uh, antibody, excuse me, if you have a positive surface antibody, that'll tell us that you have some sort of immunity to HPV. Again, though, we don't know, just by, based on this, we don't know if you're immune because you were infected, you had this acute infection in the past that's gone away, or if you were just vaccinated and given surface antigen that kind of had the same pathway. So just a positive antibody to the, I mean, a positive surface antibody tells you you're immune, but we don't know why. To, to find out why, we're going to ultimately have to use this core antibody, I mean, yeah, core antibody later on. So I hope that didn't confuse you too much. I just tried to go over what's going on with the surface antigen and antibody. Now we're going to talk about the envelope antigen and antibody. So starting with the envelope antigen, this gets released during active HPV replication. And I want to distinguish that from an active infection. You can have an, a, a hepatitis B infection that's not very infectious in the sense that it's not actively replicating its genome to try to create more uh, viruses. Sometimes you have an infection that's just kind of reached this nice steady state where it's not actively trying to replicate. So the envelope antigen is more of a marker of how infectious you are, how much re active replication the virus is going through. So as I just said, it's an in that's probably a better way to put it, is, is it's an indicator of how transmissible your disease is. So if we look at the antigen directly, if you have a, a high, a, a positive uh, envelope antigen, you're highly infectious. So normally during acute infection, you're gonna have a time where you're replicating, 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 and then your body will catch up and that infectivity will start to slowly go down. This is ideal in an acute infection. What happens if you have chronic infection? So a chronic surface antigen like this, and keep in mind, if you had chronic, this antibody wouldn't exist on this slide. Um, so if you had a chronic infection, you could still have it to where your uh, hepatitis B virus kind of reaches this steady state and actually does fall down. So this would be an example of chronic hepatitis B with low infectivity, but you could also have it where you have a chronic hepatitis infection 
that has high infectivity because that envelope antigen stays elevated. And so this is a condition in which you have chronic hep B and your envelope and antigen still getting released because your uh, hepatitis B virus in there is actively replicating. So as you can see in chronic hepatitis B, you, depending on the envelope antigen status, it'll tell you how infective they are, how transmissible the virus still is. And similar to the surface antibody, we have an envelope antibody that starts to form. And if you have a positive envelope antibody like this, that should uh, give you an idea that you have low infectivity. If you have an antibody against this uh, antigen, these antigen levels will fall and you should be uh, have a low infectivity with a positive antibody. Let's move on and talk about the core antigen and antibody now. So the core antigen here is, as the name suggests, it's inside the core of hepatitis B and it's not detectable in the blood. So you're not gonna see any release of this core antibody into the bloodstream. And that's different than what we saw with the surface antigen and the envelope. You can see how here we've been able to measure the amount of surface antigen in the blood. And even here we could measure the amount of envelope antigen. So this core antigen itself is not detectable. So why are we even measuring this? Well, the reason why we care about the core and we, we more care about the core antibody more than anything. So even though we can't detect this core antigen in the blood, our, our immune system can still uh, interact with this core antigen. It could still get presented on antigen presenting cells and we can still mount an immune response to this antigen. And we can see that response based on what type of antibody to the core antigen we find, whether it's an IgM or an IgG. So if you have any sort of antibody to the core antigen, that tells you that you were infected with the real hepatitis B virus in the past. We don't know if it's a current infection or a prior, but if you ever see any positive antibody, so it could be the IgM or IgG, that guarantees you were infected with hep B at some point. Remember when we talked about the vaccination, that was only releasing this surface antigen. So you'll never have any sort of core antibody response with just vaccination. So the let's talk about the differences between those two subtypes, those two antibodies to the core antigen. So you can have an IgM antibody or an IgG. And remember when we talked about hepatitis A, an IgM antibody often reflects an acute infection or a very, very recent infection because IgM antibodies have like 10 binding sites. So they're more often used initially. And then as you start to, uh, as your antigens are presented to different cells and you start to produce specific antibodies, you're gonna get more IgG antibodies either in the late infection or in a resolved infection. So we'll talk about that now. So let's start with the initial one. So like I just mentioned, if you ever have an anti, a core antibody to I, an IgM antibody, it's gonna be related to either an acute infection or a very recent infection. And I'll draw this on the screen right now. So this antibody, this anti-Hep B core IgM is gonna be gonna rise up in an acute infection. And as you can see, the levels will start to fall because we're gonna end up, instead of producing IgM antibodies, over time, we're gonna start producing these IgG antibodies. Now, something they really, really, really love to test, and I can, I rarely make guarantees, but I can almost guarantee that you're gonna see some of these questions like this on your shelf exam. They love that for you to know that the anti hep B core IgM antibody is the only positive marker during the window period. So what is the window period? So notice in this region right here that I've highlighted that even if you are actively infected, so let's say you had an infection, you know, your hep B surface, we know our antigens will rise. So you see how this surface antigen rose, our envelope antigen rose, and they all fell down back to here. Um, while at the same time, you can notice that our antibody levels are finally detectable in our blood around this time period, right? So if we measured 
this area, we'd find that these would be positive. If we measured in this time point, we'd find out that the anti surface antigen and the envelope antigen are positive. But what if we measured in this area here? You notice how there's a little bit of a gap here. And so this window period is a time in which if you measured this, the antibodies and antigens to your surface or envelope antibodies or antigens, it's gonna show up negative. So it'll show up like you never had an infection at all. But as you can see here in this example, this person for sure had an infection, their antigen levels fell and their antibodies rose later on. So the reason why this whole anti hep b core IgM antibody is so important is because it is the only marker that can give you the idea that this person was actually infected. So it's the only positive marker. If you measure this during the window period, you're going to get a positive anti hep b core IgM if they're actually infected. Something I, I don't know why, I'm going to mention this a lot, but uh, I think it's something that maybe traumatized me during my testing time. I had a question that didn't have anti hep core IgM as an option. And what I later learned is that sometimes, sometimes you can actually get this anti hep B envelope that we talked about earlier, this antibody to the envelope protein. Sometimes during the window period, this can also be positive. So if you see, I, I probably shouldn't be even teaching this because it'll just confuse you. I really want to reiterate this anti hep B core IgM antibody is going to be your correct answer. Like I said, I had, I think it was like on a step two practice problem where I had this one be right. But for the sake of this, we're going to assume anti hep B core IgM is your correct answer for the only positive marker during your window period. Let's change gears and talk about the anti hep B core IgG antibody. And so this, as we discussed with hepatitis A, is gonna be indicative of some sort of resolved infection. Keep in mind, hep A almost never causes a chronic infection, but hep B on the other hand, you're gonna see this IgG positive in a chronic infection. So if you ever see this poor anti hep B core IgG, you have to now think about is this a chronic infection? Is this a resolved infection? It's one of those two. And we'll draw that in here as well. So now I'm gonna take a step back. We've talked about all these different antibodies and antigens, and I've probably confused you quite a bit. What I wanna do now is talk about how it's gonna present on a clinical vignette and how you can tell the difference between each of these five categories. So let's start with an acute infection. So we saw with an acute infection, what happens is that our hep B surface antigen will rise and our hep E antigen, our envelope antigen also rises. So you can see that these two have already risen. Occasionally you can even get, you see how this are, of all the antibodies, our anti hep B core IgM antibody is the one that rises first which shouldn't surprise you because we've talked about it many times now that the IgM antibodies are detectable first and then they'll fall. And now these three here are likely IgG antibodies and that's why they're kind of a little bit slow to the game. So in an acute infection, you'll get a positive surface antigen, a positive envelope antigen, and generally speaking, you'll, you'll get a, a positive anti hep B core IgM as well what would happen in a chronic infection? So in a chronic infection, we'd be looking in this area here and keep in mind in a chronic infection, you'll still have the surface antigen being uh, produced because you still have an active infection of some sorts. You won't have that, what I did there just to clarify, um, you're not having this, you're not mounting a good antibody response. That's why you have this chronic infection. So you usually won't see uh, a significant amount of anti hep B surface antigen. And the hepatitis E antigen, we talked about this when we talked about the envelope antigen. So the envelope antigen is a marker of how transmissible your disease is, how much active replication is going on. So you could have a case of chronic hepatitis B like this, where you're very infectious still, you're very transmissible. So in this case, you would have a high envelope antigen. But keep in mind, you might also have 
a chronic hep B that's kind of reached that steady state where you're not really actively replicating too much. It's kind of like you've, you've formed this hep B infection that doesn't really care to replicate. It's kind of happy with where it's at. So you're, for sure in chronic hep B, your surface antigen will be positive. But I don't want you to assume that your hep B envelope antigen has to be positive as well. It, it might be if it's highly transmissible, but it might not be if it's not. And in this case, because we're so far down in this area here, you will see uh, an anti hep B core IgG antibody as well. What are you going to see in the window period? Well, I alluded to that window period being this section here. You're going to see, especially what I want you to pick on tests, excuse me, I want you to pick this anti hep B core IgM. That's almost always the right answer. Like I said, there was one time I had a practice problem that made it to where anti hep B, the envelope antibody was actually positive. So if you don't find anti hep B core IgM, I guess you could pick this. But like I said, I would just pick the anti hep B core IgM if it's provided. So that's the window period. What happens if you have a resolved infection? So you definitely had hep B in the past and your body cleared it correctly. You don't have any chronic infection. How would we determine that you have some sort of resolved infection? Well, in a resolved infection, we should be looking way over here. We've already mounted our immune response. The antigens have already gone. We've already created our own antibodies to all of those antigens. And now that's the only thing that we would be able to detect in our serum. So we'd be able to find our, you can see here, we'd find our antibody to the surface antigen. We could find an antibody to the envelope antigen. And because it's been so long, we would definitely find an anti-IgG antibody to the, the core antigen. Remember our IgM kind of comes up early, but then it'll peter off before we'd even test this. So how would this differ compared to somebody who had a prior vaccination? How do we tell the difference between this and somebody with a prior vaccination? Well, remember with the prior vaccination that all that did was release a bunch of surface antigen into our bloodstream, and then our, our body will mount an immune response to that. So what'll happen is that over time, our body will form an antibody to that surface antigen. That makes a lot of sense but it'll just be this. You're only gonna find out that your body, you know, your body's, your, the vaccine produced a lot of the surface antigen, it's cleared off you, and you get this antibody response. Uh, you will not see any other antibodies. You're not gonna see an antibody to the core. You're not gonna see an antibody to the envelope because it didn't encounter these antigens. The vaccine only produces this one, whereas the virus will produce all three. So in a vaccination, you're only gonna have anti-HBS positive. You're not going to have any core HB core IgG. Contrast that with our resolved infection here, where you, you will see all of these antibodies uh, present in a resolved infection to true hepatitis B. So here you go. I'll let you look at this in your, in your free time if you'd like. This is where you have, uh, this is just a chart that I've put together to make it easier to understand everything in one slide especially before test day if you're looking. So I'll leave this here for your review so and feel free to go back to this section, obviously, because it, it hep B serology is very high yield and it can be very confusing at first, but I hope I broke it down in a way that makes some sense to everybody. So let's move on from serology and talk about histology. For hepatitis B, you get this ground glass appearance on biopsy and you can see what that looks like here. It looks like frosted glass, which I can see. You can see it throughout this frosted glass appearance. And that's indicative of hep B. And treatment of hep B, um, I, I talked about it when I talked about the risk factors, about how birth is a big risk factor. So a good way to limit hep B is to make sure that everybody has their correct vaccinations. And the treatment oftentimes in adults is just symptomatic management because in adults, it rarely progresses to chronic disease. That's more of something that happens if you had it uh, in childhood. And But you can give some antivirals. There's tenofovir and, and tecavir as potential treatment options. 
Um, some complications is chronic hep B, which happens more often in neonates, but can happen in adults. And that would lead to liver cirrhosis. And as we've seen before, anything that can cause liver cirrhosis, anything with chronic inflammation can lead to cancer. And in this case, hepatocellular carcinoma. Another complication I wanna mention, and I'll talk about this when I discuss hepatitis B, is that hepatitis D can only, uh, can only infect you if you already have hepatitis B infection. So people with hep B are at risk for either in hepatitis D co-infection or super infection. And there are several other uh, there are several other complications of hepatitis B. The most important for you to recognize on this is this one disease called polyarteritis nodosa. I don't have a slide on it, but this is a vasculitis that they do test sometimes in conjunction with hepatitis B. I, I'll go over all the other this anemia, the kidney problems. I, I kind of mention that when I talk about hepatitis C because there's so many different infections. And it's through the similar mechanism. So this is a good time to segue into hepatitis C. So hepatitis C is an RNA uh, flavivirus, virus. And similar to hepatitis B, it's produced through some of those same mechanisms that we talked about blood transmission, so like transfusions, and we talked about uh, bodily contact. Um, so this will present, it could be asymptomatic, and that's generally how it is presenting, just as, a, as an asymptomatic positive screen. So you're gonna diagnose this with, uh, again, we're gonna use antibodies. So you're gonna diagnose it with the antibodies to hepatitis C virus, either their IgM or IgG. And once you've done this, because it's an RNA virus, you can actually just test their uh, RNA load to differentiate whether or not the hepatitis C virus is ongoing or if it's uh, recovered. There are several hepatitis C treatments. I've never taken too much stock into these, so I apologize if you were hoping that this section would be the, the, the one time you learn all these different names. You can, there are a ton of different uh, protease inhibitors that you can learn. There's the NS3A and 4A protease inhibitors, like Glicaprevir, Grezoprevir, and Simeprevir. You can have the NS5A inhibitors, like the cladasevir, uh, lidipasvir, vilpatasvir. And finally, you can have the NS5B inhibitors like sofosbuvir and uh, disabuvir. Let me think about how I've seen these tested. I have, I, I have definitely seen them give you the, the medication and then they ask you, what is the mechanism of action? So they'll give you like sofosbuvir and they'll say, what is the mechanism? And they'll have NS3A, NS5A, NS5B. So just remember that if you ever see a B, like the buvirs are all your NS5B. Um, it's kind of, it's a little harder to determine these ones here. The aspheres are your 5As, and then the previrs are your 3A and 4A. So however you want to memorize that, I, I apologize. I, I always remember this one, the B as our NS5B. So they, they do occasionally test that though. Uh, ribavirin can also be used as well as uh, pegylated interferon alpha. So instead of focusing on that, I did wanna focus a little bit about the complications. So we've already seen that anything with chronic, anytime you can get a chronic hepatitis infection that can lead to cirrhosis and which can lead to hepatocellular carcinoma and death. There's several different complications that they, they sometimes test. They have mixed cryoglobulinemia, lichen planus, and porphyria cutanea tarda, as well as all of these different types of uh, complications. And usually when you're studying for hep C, you'll see all these complications and you'll kind of gloss it over because there's just so much that you have to memorize for such a low yield concept. So what I want to do is I want to put this in a framework that you don't have to memorize all this stuff. It'll just come naturally to you if you ever get tested on it. So I'm gonna start by talking about mixed cryoglobulinemia. So cryoglobulins are, all those are, are immunoglobulins that end up basically forming, like they precipitate. So they, they kind of form stones, let's say, at colder temperatures. 
So what happens here is that you're gonna get an hepatitis C infection that'll activate your B cells to produce a ton of uh, immunoglobulins. And when these immunoglobulins reach areas that are kind of cold, like your fingers, your toes, your arms and legs, those all those immunoglobulins will start forming these precipitates, these stone-like things. And you're gonna get these things called purpura in, in cold sensitive areas, as you can see here on this, this screen. So let me show that in pictorial form. Let's say you have an active hep C infection. Your B cell is gonna secrete a ton of uh, either IgM or IgG antibodies, depending on where you're at uh, regarding timing. And your red blood cells will try to come through and they wanna use this, this blood vessel. The problem is that these, all these immunoglobulins, especially when they reach cold sensitive areas, they're gonna precipitate and form a stone and kind of form a blockage to those red blood cells. And so you're gonna get these like mini clot like things here. And that'll be a full, that, that's how you see that purpura that we discussed earlier. I'm gonna use that same framework to talk about a lot of the other symptoms because most of the other symptoms that we find are pretty much just related to that massive immunoglobulin release in the first place. So again, let's let's say we have our virus and our B cell produces a ton of antibodies. Uh, all those antibodies, some of them might reach the kidneys and overwhelm the kidneys and your kidneys can get damaged and you can get membranous gl glomerular nephropathy or membranoproliferative gl glomerular nephropathy. What about the complication of ITP or autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So ITP is just an autoimmune destruction of your platelets and autoimmune hemolytic anemia is just an autoimmune destruction of your red blood cells. So again, if we have our virus and it causes our B cells to produce a ton of immunoglobulins, sometimes those immunoglobulins can actually interact with our own cells too, especially early on when it's kind of nonspecific and that can damage our platelets or our red blood cells and cause either of these conditions. Now let's talk about non-Hodgkin's B-cell lymphoma. So again, if you have your hepatitis C virus and your B-cells producing all those immunoglobulins, if your B-cells are working too hard and they start forming mutations, you can actually get a B-cell lymphoma in the process. Um, this is the gamma gap, gap is something that I've seen uh, in you world a few times now on both step one. I remember seeing it on step one initially, but I saw it more for step two study resources. Uh, the gamma gap is your total protein level minus your albumin level. And so what this will do is remember how albumin usually makes up at least half of our plasma protein. So this gamma gap, what it does is it'll measure the proteins in your body that are not albumin. And if your gamma gap, so if the amount of proteins that are not albumin ever exceeds 4.0, then you should consider some other mechanism that's producing a ton of proteins. And usually the proteins that are getting produced are excess immunoglobulins. So you'll see it in a hepatitis B or hepatitis C infection, because we've just discussed how Oftentimes, in either of those conditions, you get a ton of immunoglobulins. You get a lot of antibodies that are released into your bloodstream. You might also see it in multiple myeloma or Waldenstern's macroglobulinemia. And those are conditions where, you again, you produce too many immunoglobulins uh, due to either, like, due to some sort of cancer. Before we move on from hep C complications, I do want to talk about a skin condition called lichen planus. And so lichen planus is an immune-mediated re rash with a strong association with hepatitis C. Um, how this is commonly recognized on in study resources, they like to give this mnemonic of the six Ps. So the, the lichen planus rash will usually be purple. It'll usually be very pruritic or itchy. It'll be polygonal, polygonal, which is uh, has many sharp edges. I think of like the Pokemon polygon. And you can either have, I'm gonna put both of these up. You can either have papules, plaques, or both. And all those mean a papule is a raised lesion that's less than a centimeter. 
and a plaque is a raised lesion greater than a centimeter. So you're going to have some sort of raised lesion. And either of those raised lesions will be planar, which means that if you get to the top of that skin lesion, it'll be flat. So here are a few different pictures of lichen planus. Well, actually on the left, we have lichen planus, which we just talked about. And on the right is a specific uh, subtype of lichen planus. This is Wickham striae, which are visible lines that you can see within the lichen planus uh, raised lesions, especially within the oral mucosa here. So all these white lines that you see, that's called Wickham striae. You technically can see them sometimes on actual skin, but they, they, I've never seen it tested in the skin. I've always seen Wickham striae in the setting of uh, oral mucosa, oral lichen planus, essentially. Let's finish it off. I, I guarantee you B and C were the most high yield, and that's why I spent so much time with it. We're going to now talk about hepatitis D. So hepatitis D is caused by an RNA delta virus, and it has the same transmissible risk factors as hepatitis B, so our three Bs of birth, uh, blood products, and bodily fluids. But in contrast to hepatitis B, uh, hepatitis D actually needs an active HBV infection in order to enter the hepatocytes. And so this will present as somebody who already had hepatitis B and now presents with a super infection. That's concerning for a new hepatitis D infection. Uh, you diagnose this, as we've seen with most of these, you diagnose this with an antibody to hepatitis D virus, either the IgM or the IgG. And you can, again, because it's an RNA virus like hep C, you can actually test their hepatitis D virus uh, RNA load to see if it's a resolved infection or if it's a, uh, an infection that's continuing. You can treat this with interferon alpha. And like I said, the complication you need to be aware of is that super infection. They're really not gonna, or co-infection. They're not gonna emphasize this too much. It's really just gonna be somebody who has known hepatitis B and then they all of a sudden have a really, really, really severe infection. So they might've had chronic hep B, let's say, and all of a sudden they have this extreme infection that's when you need to consider hepatitis D as the culprit. And hepatitis E is our last hepatitis that I want to talk about. This is caused by a, the RNA hepivirus. This is fecal oral transmitted. And remember what I said before was that hep A and E are the front and the back end of our hepatitis viruses. And that should remind you that their transmissibility is also from the front and the back end. Of our GI tract. So that's why you get this fecal oral transmission. Whereas hep B, C, and D have more of that either birth, bodily fluid, or blood product as their transmission usually. So this can be through contaminated water and it presents the same way as other hepatitis infections. Um, but the one caveat, and this is really the only way they test this, maybe not the only way, they'll, they'll either test it by saying somebody has hep E and they'll ask you about the transmission or they'll test it more commonly as a pregnant woman who has fulminant liver failure. And so you can remember the E for the E in pregnant or some people like to remember expectant mothers, which is you know another term for pregnant. The E for hepatitis E is the same as the E in expectant mothers. And so if you ever see hepatitis causing fulminant liver failure in somebody who's pregnant, strongly, strongly, strongly consider hepatitis E. And it is a self-limiting disease. So that's the only thing you really have to know about hepatitis E. And again, I've, I've put together uh, a study aid for you because we talked about a lot of different things there. And so here's, here's your nice study aid. And remember, I also made a study aid specific to the hepatitis B serology markers because that is again, one of the more high yield uh, subcategories of this entire section. So we've talked about hepatitis now, we've gone through all the different types of hepatitis. Let's switch it up and talk about hepatic tumors now. So hepatic tumors, there's six different tumors I want you to know. Three of them are malignant, so we'll talk about those three at first. And there's also three benign tumors listed below. So let's start from the top and go down. A hepatocellular carcinoma is something we've talked about quite a bit now, but we haven't addressed directly. 
This is our most common primary liver cancer. And it's usually in the setting of chronic liver disease and cirrhosis. And for this reason, anybody who has cirrhosis is supposed to be uh, scheduled to receive uh, routine screening abdominal ultrasounds to evaluate for HCC. And some of the risk factors, it's pretty much anything that can cause cirrhosis. So we've already talked about some of these. We've talked about chronic viral hepatitis. We've talked about uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic liver cirrhosis, autoimmune hepatitis. And later on, we'll talk about these other three, hemochromatosis, Wilson's, and alpha-1 antitrypsin. So anything that can cause cirrhosis, which is consistent with what I've tried to teach you throughout the GI unit, is anything that can cause chronic inflammation increases your risk for cancer. So this is no exception. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned, and I just want you to realize it is a risk factor, is that uh, there's a type of species called aspergillus, which can produce an aflatoxin, and that can actually increase your risk of hepatocellular carcinoma as well. So how, how does HCC present? Uh, you could have some symptoms like right upper quadrant pain, weight loss, and a palpable mass, uh, you could have, and generally speaking, this would be in somebody who already has cirrhosis and may have some sequela of that cirrhosis, like jaundice, ascites, splenomegaly. What I want to uh, reiterate, though, is that this can still be asymptomatic, and that's why we do our screens. That's why we do our right upper quadrant ultrasounds to evaluate for any liver, uh, for any HCC or suspicious masses in people with liver cirrhosis, because it doesn't always present symptomatically. And a good biomarker that you can use to assess for hepatocellular carcinoma is this elevated alpha fetoprotein level, or AFP. You can also uh, attempt to diagnose it, uh, maybe not diagnose it, but you can, if you do imaging studies like the ultrasound we talked about, or sometimes you can do a CT or an MRI and, and find uh, a concerning mass. And once you've done that, what you should do, you should never say, oh, this person has an elevated AFP, oh, or this person has uh, a somewhat suspicious mass on ultrasound. That's not gonna give you the diagnosis directly. That'll just give you a suspicion for it. The gold standard is still to biopsy it, biopsy that mass to confirm HCC. And so HCC has a few different treatment options. You can surgically resect the mass if it's small enough. A lot of times they're gonna have repeated uh, doses of radiofrequency ablation or chemoembolization, which just means that they can either target that specific, uh, either the blood vessel that it's attached to, or they can give targeted chemotherapy to that region specifically to help treat that. You can also uh, treat it with something called VEGF inhibitors. These usually just stop your blood vessels from proliferating. And so again, because the liver is such a highly vascularized region, as you've probably already seen, you can see how embolization would kind of um, cauterize some concerning blood vessels. Uh, you can see that this VEGF inhibitors would try to turn off the liver's ability to create more blood vessels in that region. And if, if possible, if they are a candidate, you should consider liver transplantation in anybody who's a candidate. This has a very pro poor prognosis. Their two-year survival is less than 50%. And some complications, you could get Bud Chiari syndrome because of invasion into the hepatic vein causing a blood clot. And you could also get metastases spread to other sites like the lungs, bones, and adrenal glands. Now let's move on to another type of liver cancer, uh, liver metastases. And I mentioned to you that HCC was the most common primary liver cancer. Well, liver metastases are the most common liver cancer at all. And so where do these liver metastases start? Well, generally speaking, they, they usually start in either the GI tract, lung, or breast tissue uh, throughout the unit, whether it was gastric adenocarcinoma, colorectal carcinoma, pancreatic carcinoma, didn't really matter. Anywhere in the GI tract, I told you that the most common site of liver metastases was the GI tract. So keep that in mind. 
this will present, the presentation will be dependent actually on what the primary tumor is. You'll usually see weight loss. You could get liver disease potentially if the liver metastases are very, very widespread. And you, you're gonna get whatever symptoms are associated with your primary cancer. And on imaging, you're gonna find multiple liver nodules and that's important. So here's a couple examples of liver metastases and how they like to test this. They like to give you this picture and then they'll tell you, they'll ask you um, where, or they'll ask you where the primary cancer is and they'll have liver as an option. But just keep in mind, if you ever have multiple liver nodules like this or multiple liver nodules like this, that, that should tell you that it's actually not originating within the liver. It's probably originating somewhere else, like the GI tract is very common. And what's happening is that that GI tract cancer is throwing all of its cancer seeds through the portal system, and they're just getting embedded here and starting to form little cancers all throughout your liver. So the last malignant tumor that I want you to know about is something called hepatic angiosarcoma. This is a rare uh, vascular tumor with a very, very, very poor prognosis. It's got a 100% mortality rate at two years. And so this tumor forms if you inhale certain carcinogens. And the one they really, really emphasize on tests is vinyl chloride. So they'll give you a patient. They pretty much have to give you a patient who's working in a factory creating PVC pipes or something of that nature in order to lead you to this hepatic angiosarcoma. Um, the other way they sometimes test it is in arsenic, which can be found in your environment in general. Again, I haven't seen that tested because they'd have to be pretty, they'd have to be pretty explicit to tell you that there's high arsenic levels nearby. So in order to get this, just keep in mind this PVC pipe factory, if you ever see that, I want your, you know, the light bulb in your head to kind of at least consider this hepatic angiosarcoma when you see PVC pipes, but also don't forget about this arsenic exposure. And so this will present with the same way that we've seen a lot of other cancers. You can get weight loss, abdominal pain, jaundice. You can get, you know, the sequelae of liver cirrhosis. And so just keep, just as long as you know these risk factors, you, you can get this question right. Okay, so now that we've talked about the three malignant tumors, let's switch it up and talk about the benign uh, liver tumors. And something I've intentionally done is I've put hepatic adenoma at the bottom of this list. I feel like whenever I talk to my classmates back in the day, studying for step one, hepatic adenoma was all, whenever you saw a benign tumor, you always wanted to pick hepatic adenoma. It's like our, our I don't know, it's just the benign tumor that we learn most. And it's actually the third most common. So I'll go in this order and I want you to differentiate these because this is something that's tested. They want you to know what a biopsy would show for each of these three different benign tumors. So let's start with a cavernous hemangioma. This is the most common benign liver tumor and it's caused by uh, vascular malformations. And you'll see this more often in females between ages 30 and 50. And on histology, you're gonna get these vascular regions and thrombus formation. So on a picture to the right, you can see a lot of vascular regions here and you can see regions, the circle right here, you can see the thrombus that's starting to form. And you don't wanna biopsy these if you can avoid it because there's a strong risk of hemorrhage. And now with FNH or focal nodular hyperplasia, this is the second most common benign liver tumor. It's associated with congenital AV malformations and it can still be related to uh, oral contraceptive use. And on histology, you're gonna see this central stellate scar, which I've kind of highlighted one part of this scar. You can see it all the way through here. And finally, we'll talk about your favorite benign liver tumor, the hepatic adenoma. This is the third most common. It's associated with oral contraceptive or anabolic steroid use. Again, it's common in adult women and it, it's fueled by estrogen use, which means that during pregnancy, when your estrogen levels are really high, it has a risk of rupture. On histology, you're gonna find a well-circumscribed nodule 
with a regular reticulin scaffold. So what does that mean? Well circumscribed just means that you can tell the difference between, if I take this away, you can tell the difference between the nodule and associated tissues. And then the reticulin, you can actually stain this with reticulin to see if it has a nice uh, normal reticulin scaffold. There's nothing concerning going on. And so right here, if you look at all these different cells, you can see each cell has a nice membrane. Everything's, everything's good. And you can treat this by, usually you wanna just discontinue the, the estrogen fuel. So you discontinue the oral contraceptives or steroids. If the tumor gets very large though, you might have to resect it. And here's a slide that shows you the differences between these three. And they usually don't give you a picture. They usually just give you the verbiage. So they'll say that uh, they did a biopsy and it showed a central stellate scar, or they'll say they have vascular spaces and thrombi or they'll say a well-circumscribed nodule with a reticulin scaffold. So you really do have to know each of these things because some, all of these can happen in young women. Some of them are associated with OCP use. So that really doesn't help you to determine, oh yeah, this is definitely hepatic adenoma. It's really good to know each of these three, um, each of these three conditions, as well as what, how they would describe it on a test. Um, there's a few other hepatic tumors that I haven't mentioned yet. I just want to bring it up here. Uh, cholangiocarcinoma, I'm going to talk about, as well as liver abscesses. Um, cholangiocarcinoma, we actually did discuss in the hepatobiliary lecture. I'll, it's just a cancer that originates within your bile duct cells, and it's usually resulting from chronic bile duct inflammation. And the risk factors that I want you to be aware of you can get this from primary sclerosing cholangitis, as well as the Chinese li liver fluke, Planorchis sinensis. And so both of these are causing chronic inflammation and that could lead to cholangiocarcinoma. What I wanted to spend a little bit more time on are liver abscesses. So liver abscesses are walled off infections of your liver and they can be caused by several different pathogens. So sometimes what'll happen is that the, the bacteria that lives in your GI tract, like E. coli, enterococcus, Klebsiella, sometimes those can sneak into your liver and they can actually form an abscess in that area. You can also get it to where the bacteria that might've infected your entire bloodstream, like let's say you have Staphylococcus bacteremia or Streptococcus infection, sometimes that can actually go through your bloodstream, deposit in your liver, and form an abscess as well. What I'll spend more of my time on, though, are these atypical presentations because they are tested. So you can get a protozoa called Entamoeba histolytica that'll form liver abscesses. You can also get a, a helmet called Echinococcus granulosis that will, will form an abscess in your liver, or it'll form cysts in your liver more than anything. So let's first start by talking about Entamoeba histolytica. So this is a protozoa that affects 30 to 50 million people worldwide. So very common. It gets transmitted through cysts, ingestion of cysts in contaminated water sources. And you can see a cyst right here. And later on, we'll talk about the trophozoite here. And it's classically, it can consume these red blood cells. And that's what you're seeing here. So how does this pathogenesis work? So what will happen is that somebody will ingest a cyst from a contaminated water source. That cyst will ultimately uh, transform into a trophozoite. So it'll kind of mature into a trophozoite in our small intestine. And most of the time you're actually gonna get non-invasive disease. And what that, do what that means is that your trophozoite will attach to your intestine and it'll start forming a ton of cysts that can be excreted in a stool, but it doesn't actually invade the intestine. It's very happy where it is. However, 10% of the time you can get invasive disease. And this is where the trophozoite actually invades your intestine, which will form these flask shaped ulcers. That'll enter your bloodstream and consume some red blood cells in the process. And then, to top it all off, it will go to different organs in your body, like your liver, your lungs, and your brain, and it can form abscesses in those regions. 
So let's let's show that pathogenesis. So if this is the GI lumen. You can have a cyst that forms and matures into a trophozoite. And most of the time, it'll attach to your small intestine and just uh, create a bunch of cysts. And so this is more common, non-invasive disease. They're not going to test you on the non-invasive type because it's not too dissimilar to other stuff. What they will emphasize, though, is this invasive disease because it has uh, a few different unique characteristics that you're not going to see anywhere else. So again, it'll form these, it'll, the cyst will mature into a trophozoite that will not only attach to the wall, but it'll start burrowing through that intestinal wall and forming these classic flask shaped ulcers, which they do mention on question stems. It'll enter the bloodstream and there it can consume some red blood cells if it wants. And finally, it'll deposit in the liver, lungs, or brain and form abscesses. So this, how, how does this present? Well, because the trophozoites are physically burrowing through the intestinal wall and forming those ulcers, you could end up seeing bloody diarrhea as a consequence. You could also get abdominal pain for these same reasons and fever because you have an infection. You can diagnose this either through the stool microscopy or antigen testing. And on colonoscopy, you'll see these flask-shaped ulcers. Like I said, they do like to mention that on tests. And you'll also see those trophozoites with engulfed RBCs. So normally on a test, they're not gonna they're not gonna say, hey, you have this person with these symptoms and their antigen tested positive for entamoeba. That would defeat the whole purpose of asking the question, right? What they'll probably do is they'll give you these symptoms and then they'll either say they had a colonoscopy which revealed flask-shaped ulcers or they had a trophozoite with engulfed RBCs, or they might say, you know, the right the right lobe of the liver have some mass on it. So you'll have to kind of deduce that, okay, maybe this is not a cancer, maybe this is something else, maybe this is entamoeba because of these, you know, classic uh, presentations. And again, here's here's a, an, a picture of, they, they might show this picture or talk about it, they'll show you a trophozoite with a ton of red blood cells inside of it. So how do you treat this? So uh, sometimes they like to emphasize the, in, they call them intraluminal agents versus systemic agents. So I'll, I'll kind of go over the treatment algorithm based on whether it's just an asymptomatic infection or an invasive systemic infection. So if it's an asymptomatic infection and you just uh, discover this incidentally usually or on stool microscopy, for example, um, you can use intraluminal agents and that'll kill all the cysts that are inside your lumen. So inside your intestinal lumen, you can use paromomycin or idonoquinol. If you have an invasive infection, you should consider giving metronidazole or metronidazole and another gram negative. And I would say as far as what's important for testing is they do like you to know these intraluminal agents. They want you to know that peromomycin and iodoquinol can be used as an intraluminal agent to kill the cysts that are still in the intestine. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about echinococcus granulosis. And echinococcus granulosis is a protozoa and it's classically associated with hydatid cyst formation in the liver. And on the left here, you can see some cysts, several uh, hydatid cysts in the liver. And on the right, you can see one of those uh, cysts just blown up for you. And what I wanna do with echinococcus, I wanna talk about the life cycle because they do like to test what animal is the intermediate host versus the, in the definitive host versus the aberrant intermediate host. So I wanna go over all that just so you're not confused on the test. So how this life cycle works normally is that what'll happen is that uh, cysts will mature inside of intermediate hosts. And intermediate hosts are things like livestock, like sheep, cattle, and pigs. And once these cysts mature, they are excreted in a stool. Uh, from there, we have cysts that are now in the stool, 
they are ingested by dogs. And because dogs are definitive hosts, they can mature, these cysts can actually mature into their adult forms. So larva and adult tapeworms. And I probably should have specified the difference between intermediate and definitive host. If you haven't figured it out yet, intermediate hosts can are basically hosts that can help the uh, pathogen, in this case, echinococcus, it can help it mature to some extent, but that pathogen can never mature into its adult form in an intermediate host. And that's why we see that in sheep, cattle, and pigs, we see that it can mature into a cyst, but it cannot mature into the final adult form. And we're gonna see the same thing later when we talk about humans, because humans are also intermediate hosts. On the other hand, dogs, as you can see, once the cysts were ingested by dogs, they were able to mature into larvae and adult tapeworms because they are the definitive hosts in this case. And so once they've matured into these adult tapeworms, the dog feces will contain thousands and thousands of eggs that are being released by the tapeworms. And those eggs will be again ingested by those same intermediate hosts like sheep, cattle, and pigs. And you're gonna have this cyclical pattern where those eggs can then mature into cysts and then they'll be excreted and ingested by dogs and you can see the cyclical pattern. And I'll just show this in the pictorial form just to make it even easier to understand. We have our cysts that are, are excreted from uh, livestock. They're ingested by dogs and they mature into adult tapeworms. Those tapeworms will release eggs and those eggs will be ingested by the livestock which will again mature into the cyst, then you have this, uh, this nice cycle going on. So how do humans fit into all this? So what happens to humans is that instead of these eggs being ingested by their normal intermediate hosts, they'll instead be ingested by humans, which are considered aberrant intermediate hosts. So again, if we look at this picture, instead of the intermediate host, the normal intermediate host, livestock, like sheep, cattle, and swine, uh, ingesting the eggs, It'll these eggs from dog feces will be ingested by humans. And so let's talk about what happens there. So these eggs ingested, they will mature into something called an oncosphere, and that will be able to secrete cysts. And all of these cysts can invade the intestinal wall enter our bloodstream and ultimately deposit in tissues. And on tests, they really love the hydatid cysts that form in the liver specifically. So keep that in mind, but it can also form in the lungs and brain, although I haven't really seen that on a test question. And so how do we treat this? Uh, you can give albendazole if the disease is limited, or sometimes you'll give this antiparasitic albendazole after they've had surgery, just to make sure that you've pretty much uh, wiped out all of the pathogens. But especially in the case of uh, significant uh, cyst formation, you're often going to require surgical resection. And something they don't really test too often, but I just wanted to mention that d this surgery, uh, there's a few different ways to go about it, and you don't need to know how they aspirate it and inject alcohol and all that stuff. But just know that during the surgery, if a, if a cyst does leak, it can form an anaphylactic reaction, or it can actually start seeding other areas of the body too. So it's a, it can be one of the complications that you have to worry about in these surgeries.